let Hope talk now. Are you sure? Sure. <laughs> Obviously, it's a thrill, a real thrill. One of the highlights of my career is the honor of having worked with Dr. Ruth. And in fact, I knew you before you were Dr. Ruth. <laughs> and I... <laughs> Doctoral dissertation advisor, I wouldn't be Dr. Ruth without hope. And I would say that it's, I'm not, the, one of the reasons we were able to work together so happily for so many years, and you got your doctorate with us, and now you are teaching with us again in the Elbenwood Center in the department, teaching a wonderful course on families, television, media. and other media, and it's much sought after and much appreciated. One of the reasons was I, because I said, I said so what, but <laughs> that is also in a way typical of your whole biography. You have been said so what to problems for many years and kept going. I, I have to say that year before last, we had a session here, um, also well attended, where we showed clips of a video from a BBC film presentation of Dr. Ruth as one of the outstanding women of the world. Now you would think that might be enough. You think anyone might stop with that. It was a, it's a very difficult video, actually a very serious one, because it shows your childhood and how you overcame problems of the Holocaust and continued to go on and thrive. <coughs> but. Here you are, we're celebrating, and I'm not sure how many books, you have to tell me how many books, we're celebrating yet another book, which is going to be coming out on June 4th, on another birthday, and we're gonna look forward to many more birthdays and many more books, and I wanna ask you later on what you will do on your 100th birthday. <laughs> but this book is basically about joy, joie de vivre, how you kept going. And it's the, what the title is, the doctor is in. And I just have to say that <clears throat> every week when you come to teach your class, and Carrie Russo is a wonderful part of the Elbenwood Center, and I wait eagerly for you to come. And we may be down and grumpy and annoyed with various administrative things, and not everything always goes right in any institution. What should they say? Administrator here. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then Dr. Ruth walks in. The doctor is in the office and everything is happy and there's this amazing energy. And I saw this today. We were in the session this morning and then we walked down the hall. Maybe this is not polite, but we went into the ladies' room. You couldn't even get out of the ladies' room without signing programs. <laughs> <laughs> and you did it with characteristically such wonderful grace and concern for the other person. And I've seen you do this in all kinds of gatherings. Oh, Take you by the hand. This is the person you should know, you must meet. And then having a genuine interest in the, what other people are doing. And I think that is part of what the doctor does when she's in, <laughs> or out, or all over the world. And I'm wondering if you would want to tell us a little bit about how this book connects with some of the things in your earlier biography. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate those who chose Teachers College. We are the new students. Do we have any? Congratulations. <laughs> and, I, and the reason for that is that I really consider myself foremost as an educator. And if anybody, to you I congratulate you because you are not choosing Wall Street. You are not choosing some other big paying uh, positions. Maybe you'll become Dr. Ruth. It pays very well. <laughs> <laughs> but what I, on a serious note, what I am so delighted is because I do see myself as an educator, and not only that. When somebody asks me, out coming out of Nazi Germany, how can I have this joie de vivre that all of you are going to have when you walk out of this room? This is why I fit into Hope's department, because I do believe that the early socialization, the early years of a child are crucial. I was at home with loving parents, an only child, 
of uh, loving Orthodox Jewish parents. I know it's the last day of Passover, but in the Reform and in Israel it's over, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I do believe that at the age of 10 and a half, after my father was taken to a labor camp, um, not to a concentration camp yet, I do believe that the way I look at the world and the way I believe in all of the things that you people are doing in terms of educating has to do with this early childhood experiences that were so wonderful. And at the end, when we show you a clip, I'll say something else about the childhood experience. I then, because my father was taken to a labor camp, uh, he wrote that I have to join a kinder transport, a group of um, people who were going 1939, just before the war started. The war started in September of 39 uh, to uh, Switzerland. There was a conference in Evian that uh, was called Let's Save German Jewelry. There were uh, people, representatives from all kinds of countries. Somebody sent uh, Roosevelt sent somebody from the United States. That conference failed miserably. They could not agree what they could do with those German Jews who were in danger. Out of that conference came one cry, let's at least save the children. And because of that, England at the time, dark cloud on the horizon, England took 10,000 Jewish German children, Holland, Belgium, France, and Switzerland took 300. <coughs> For some reason, which I will never know, I was in the group of the children who went to Switzerland and was in a children's home that became an orphanage. And I was there for six years. So part of my whole being is to say how grateful I am that I'm alive, how grateful I am that I can be, uh, make a dent in society because that's what many of us, I did a longitudinal study of the children who were with me in that children's <coughs> home. And it's very interesting, all of the girls went into the helping profession. You could have said that orphans who have lost everything, their family, their everything, their identity, would not be able to make it. And it's interesting that the, in the longitudinal study, because they all were home, for the first at least six years of their lives, that early socialization, they all, they made it. And the girls went into the helping profession. They went to become either kindergarten teachers like me, or nurses, something, social workers, something in the helping profession. Because they said, I said to myself, it's in my diaries, I survived, I have an obligation to make a difference in the world. That's what you all are doing, because you are sitting here on a Saturday, you're not in a bar, you are, not <laughs> <laughs> you are uh, contemplating a serious future endeavor, and that's what I'm very grateful about. The joie de vivre has to do with my being very Jewish, because in the Jewish tradition, there is something, not only that I can talk about sex, because in the Jewish tradition, sex has never been a sin. It has been a mitzvah, a good deed. <laughs> only when you are married. Don't, uh, no, that <laughs> only, only after marriage. But I think that part of what makes me uh, be who I am has to do with being rooted in, uh, in that uh, Jewish tradition. So in, the, in that... <laughs> You can ask about sex later. <laughs> we will have time for questions. <laughs> um, well, let me, let me just pick up on, on several pieces of this. Um, for one thing, it has to do with whether you can predict what's going to happen to someone. And I have to say, when you walked into the office and I said, so what? And I, I think I would have said, so what? In general, I, I believe it's characteristic of my ideas about education, of giving people chances. But I had 
an idea there was something very special about you. I didn't really know much about you. I, even after I got to know you, I would never have predicted that you would become Dr. Ruth because that didn't exist. You are America's favorite sex therapist, some say, but, and now there are many, and there may have been before, but the particular versions that you created, I think, are examples of innovation. We're talking now about agility and creating new forms, having new ideas of education, new ideas of where it can take place. And you invented a whole way of educating on this then touchy topic through your radio program. And I think perhaps if you could tell us a little bit about the, the radio program and how you, what kinds of things you did yeah. to start talking about topics that were at that time not that um, easy to talk about. Some people say to me, are you embarrassed by Dr. Ruth? Mm -hmm. And I would say, never. Maybe not never. <laughs> but, but, but above all, I, I'm awed. I'm awed. <laughs> so uh, a couple of things. First of all, even later in your questions, I never, I always say you never have to say I. You can say somebody from Teachers College, <laughs> <laughs> from the alumni, or you can say I heard on radio or television. And I have done that all my <laughs> professional life. That it's not, I never would do a reality show on television. Mm -hmm. I did uh, 450 television shows. The people that I talked to who came with problems, we assigned the problem. These were all actors and actresses. I would never do something with real people. Actors and actresses who after they pre presented me with a problem, I tried to solve it, or I said you have to go to see a medical doctor, or you have to uh, go to see a psychiatrist, but who um, afterwards got paid, and I said you did that very well, and I could sleep at night. So I was always, on the one hand, I had chutzpah, do you all know what that means? Yes. It means nerve of doing something. I had the chutzpah to talk about orgasms and erections, don't blush hope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before, that was in 1981 on radio. And um, I think part of it was I was, after my doctorate here, I was very fortunate. I worked for seven years with Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan at Cornell uh, Medical Center. And as you know, I'm four foot seven, I just lost a quarter of an inch, but I'm short. <laughs> Very important for me to be standing on the shoulders of giants. So she was a wonderful trainer. I was very well trained. I myself would not have known that before teachers college, I'm going to teach six years Princeton and Yale, a, sem a, um, a course each semester. What I did do is I believed strongly in what I'm doing in terms of educating. My expertise was human sexuality, but I, I have to tell you something. There is another a children's book coming out, because you told me that I have to talk about that. I do believe in the image of a turtle. A turtle, if it stays, that's important for all of you educators. A turtle, if it stays in one place, it's safe. Nothing can happen to that turtle. If that turtle wants to move, it has to take a risk. It has to stick its neck out. It could get hurt, but without it sticking its neck out and taking a risk, it does not move. And I have believed, I have, I have now maybe 30, how many do I have, Patty? Maybe 30 uh, little, um, you just brought turtle. me a turtle. I just brought you a turtle. From Colombia. From, from Colombia, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the so, other Colombia with an O, not a U. <laughs> <laughs> so I think when I made that presentation, I was very well trained. I was a professor already at Lehman College, Brooklyn College, in teaching how to teach sex education. And when I was given the opportunity to talk to the group, to a group of broadcasters, I, my heart was beating a little bit. I thought, what am I getting into here? But then I did say, for you, very important. I told the broadcasters, you are significant others. In sociology, it means you are an important person. I said, we have the data about human sexuality. 
I want to do a program. You have the power of the airwaves. Let's do it together. That was before anybody knew about AIDS, but I talked about contraception. I talked about all of the issues in terms of sexuality, and I was fortunate. Within one week, they gave me 15 minutes, a quarter after midnight, and it was a taped program. 15 mm. minutes, NBC radio, and I answered questions that I got in writing. I had two researchers that I trained, but I myself signed every single letter. I didn't let anybody else sign the letters. So I did, and then it became 10 years, two, year, uh, two hours each Sunday night. I see somebody over there remembers that. And fortunately for me, Walkman came on the market. So children didn't have to be told, take a shower. <laughs> they, 10 o'clock on Sunday nights, they were in bed with a Walkman, <laughs> and the parents couldn't know what they were listening to. <laughs> I did that for 10 years. Now, I also was very careful. When I took a vacation, which I did, I go to Israel every year, I did not give my program to any psychologist. And, or to anybody, a psychiatrist, or anybody else, or any other sex therapist. Because I needed people to know that that's me, and as you hear the accent, it wasn't difficult. <laughs> so I did, um, talking about the accent, when I came to this country, before Teachers College, they told me that I have to take speech lessons. To, to get rid of my accent. I said, okay, one day I will. I made one dollar an hour. I could not take speech lessons. Guess what? Deborah Jo Rapp, who plays me now in different places, now the, the play is going to be in uh, Montgomery, in, in Alabama. Montgomery, Alabama, you said, yeah. And the play is called Becoming Dr. Ruth. Guess what? Deborah Jo Rapp, you all know her from the program, uh, the 70s show. She was wonderful, she got an award. Other people now play it around the country. Guess what? When she took that role, she had to take a speech coach <laughs> and pay to learn my accent. <laughs> <laughs> so, to add to that, in the Talmud, in the Jewish tradition, it says, a lesson important for you teachers, a lesson taught with humor is a lesson retained. I could not tell you a joke. I hear jokes every day, they go in one ear out the other. But I can hear your questions and I can see some humor. And that's when I told you before that I do believe that being rooted in that Jewish tradition has helped me greatly. I'm glad you mentioned the turtle because it's, it's really an important image and I think this is yet another one of your publications that's going to be coming out. Um, the book for children. And I wonder how this image will help children. Mm -hmm. So, since I all the time talk about the turtle, I did call my grandson in Ottawa and said, can I call the boy in the children's book, Ben? And he said, yes. So, the book, here's what it helps. The book is about that uh, Ben wants to play soccer, but he's scared. And I say, you have to take a risk. You have to try it. He tries. He actually wins a goal. And guess what? The whole team of the soccer players is being called the turtles at the end of the book. <laughs> what I want to show with that is that you have sometimes to take a risk. You have to try something that you haven't tried, not to be scared, even if you do fail. Like I failed and I told Hope, I flunked my exam. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm trying to see with that by saying, you know, nobody, nobody can do everything. And if, you, if there are some um, issues where you need help, go and get help. That goes back to my being a sex therapist. I say, if you have a problem, go and see a therapist. Don't let that relationship crumble or disappear because you have a problem. 
in my practice, I don't do any practice anymore because I'm very happy to teach. And because we're happy you're teaching. <laughs> because the practice, you have to work at night. <coughs> People these days cannot tell their employers, uh, I have to go to therapy. Patty is leading a big company. People cannot come and say, Patty, I have to go to therapy. Uh, <laughs> that was possible some years ago. And so I do believe, I believe in therapy, but I don't do that anymore. But when I did therapy, I was very careful. I was really super careful. If somebody came with a depression, I said, I'm not giving you a second appointment. What the sex therapist does is take a sexual status examination. A physician takes a medical status examination. A sex therapist takes a sexual status examination. I ask specific questions. What, what is your problem? How can I be helpful? If I detected that um, a man or a woman uh, were depressed or alcoholics, I didn't give them a second appointment because I would not be successful. You cannot do this psychosexual therapy when somebody is depressed or alcoholic. I said, you have to go first to a psychiatrist, clear up the depression, <laughs> then come back to me. Or go to Alcohol Anonymous, then come back to me. So you have to learn, which they taught me, how to uh, tease out which mm. people mm. you can actually help. And in today's world, with all of the internet and with all of the uh, knowledge available, in this country, we have the best scientifically validated data about human sexual functioning that has ever been available. France has some data, we have the best. We need more. We need institutions, we need uh, medical centers, we have to do, there need to be more research, scientifically validated, vigorous research in order to be even better sex therapists and sex educators. We don't have the luxury not to talk about it. And it's very interesting, I just read in the New York Times two days ago, in Europe, they actually are now teaching how to make babies because they are worried about their population <laughs> shrinking. <laughs> yeah. So we have to know what happens in the world, but we do have, uh, we, we have that ability to know about issues of sexuality. One of the things that I think is, is, is this on? Yeah. Yes. yeah. One of the things that I think is impressive to me, and um, you're a celebrity, and that's, that's, that's nice. Short. You're also Short. a joyous celebrity, because I've heard you say, isn't it fun to be Dr. Ruth? <laughs> and and you're, you're always delighted and genuinely pleased when people recognize you and know you. But this ties in with a question of, when you do a program on the radio, when you do a television program, when you teach a class, how do you know the outcomes? And when do you know the outcomes? And I would say that one thing that it, I think is important and one thing that I've seen demonstrated by going places with you is that sometimes it takes a long time before people tell you what they learned. And mm -hmm. sometimes you really don't know and you, it may be years later, someone will say, someone just said something to me yesterday about not really um, wanting to say what he had learned from you for many years. And I think that's one of the exciting things, and I would hope we can use this as a model for not expecting everything to be measurable instantly. But let me just tell a story about this. We had lunch um, sometime a while ago when you had your office near that wonderful pastry shop, and I think you bought several birthday cakes for my late husband. And then you said, well, we've got to get a cab to get you home with the birthday cakes. So you run out into the street uh, with the cakes and you stop a cab immediately. And he said, oh, Dr. Ruth, Dr. Ruth, I, I can't tell you what I've learned from you. It was so wonderful that I had to get in with the cakes and then you didn't go along because I was going home. I think the poor driver was very disappointed that he didn't get to have, her, have you. But it's a wonderful example of unexpected feedback. I wonder if you have any comments yeah. on that. I tell you what, what pops right away in my mind. I told you that when I started the radio, nobody knew about AIDS. Very shortly afterwards, yeah. it was an epidemic. 
there was a young man, no name because I never asked for names, <laughs> from Indiana. He said, Dr. Ruth. Now, I didn't give myself the name Dr. Ruth. I, I said Dr. Ruth Westheimer. <laughs> But they couldn't say Westheimer, too long a name. <laughs> so they said Dr. Ruth, and I said, OK, Dr. Ruth. He said he's in 11th grade. He feels attracted to boys, to men. He said if he tells that to his parents, they're going to kick him out of the house. Don't forget, that was in the 80s. I said, keep your mouth shut tight. Don't talk to anybody finish high school, then you go to university, a large university where they have groups for people like you. And then you go to a large city. Guess what? Some years ago, I'm at a restaurant in New York City. The waiter says, Dr. Ruth, before you leave, I have to talk to you. That happens to me. I go to a corner. <laughs> he said, <laughs> <laughs> he said, Dr. Ruth, you saved my life yeah. because he was the one calling from Indiana. And by my saying, keep your mouth shut, it is nobody's business. You don't have to confront your parents. If you know that that is not something because of religious or whatever attitude they cannot, um, they cannot live with, then keep your mouth shut. And, I, and he did. And he's a waiter in New York. He said, I, I, you saved my life. That makes me feel six feet tall. <laughs> because that is something that a program like this, by my being so old fashioned, such a stick in the mud, so, <laughs> so careful by saying, I believe in relationships. I know people do other things. But I say, be, at least be careful. But I have never changed that attitude of um, that I believe being in a relationship is the best way. So you here, look around. Any of you who are not married, I want a shidduch, that means a match, to come out of this group. <laughs> but I, no, not right away sex, just a match. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I have heard you promise good sex if you come to Teachers College. And anyone who's deciding whether to come or not, you have made that promise. <laughs> But then I've also heard you sort of whisper and say, of course, that's nonsense. They have to do it themselves, so do it yourself. <laughs> but I have, um, I have lots of other questions that I'd like to hear you talk more about. But one of them is the issue of the role of music. We have been working on a project on musical, on memory. I, I work on family memories. Mm -hmm. And that includes issues of how you talk across generations about a variety of things, which is also relevant. But in that is the question of how music enters into the joy in life and the joy in education. And you have, among your many books, and several of them are upstairs in the lounge. Uh, this one is not yet out, but several are upstairs in the lounge through Teachers College Press, where we, I happen to be on the advisory board. They're not that I, it, it didn't need a decision to publish your books, but um, they are there. And one is on music. It's called Heavenly Sex. And <laughs> but could you say something yeah. about the importance of music and no. why we started yeah. to work together on the issue of music yeah. and memory and the role of music in creating this kind of joie de vivre has been so important to you? So I did a book called Musically Speaking, not Sexually Speaking. And in a clip that you are going to see in a moment, um, uh, it will explain that. I do believe that I couldn't sing. My son, Joel, um, also just now published a book, Teachers College Press, yes. about um, education for citizenship. My son, Joel, big short educator in Ottawa, when he was six, he said, Mommy, don't sing happy birthday to me because you <laughs> sing false. So, so I, I can't sing. I, play a little recorder, because in Israel at the time, everybody played the recorder. And, um, but music and the melodies from Frankfurt, my childhood memories, were something that accompanied me throughout all of the years of being an orphan. 
and the, the, the music from the synagogue and the music from the street uh, uh, and, and, the, and the childhood memories. So I do believe that uh, music is a very important ingredient and in terms of socialization. I'm a little saddened if I think that people now are never going to listen <coughs> to music in a group. Everybody's just going to listen to it on their iPhone. Right, I think right. that in a group, just looking at somebody and smiling and knowing that you are listening to the same music makes a, makes a difference. So I think that that's part. And what we are going to do uh, eventually, party, we, we need some money. Everybody, <laughs> did you hear? <laughs> so what we are doing, Patti is a graduate from Teachers College. What we want to do is to, to, talk, to do a project with Moti Lazar, whom you know. She was on the board of that concert that you missed because you went to see your granddaughter in Colombia, but you did right. <laughs> so um, what we want to do is, what does that musical memory, how does that help to keep the relationship in terms of keep you grounded in the past, but also keep that relationship of um, members of the family, of friends, of whoever it is that you associate with. Well, let me, let me just pick up on this for a minute. I don't blush about matters of sexuality very easily. I do blush over money. But anyway, I'm glad <laughs> you're able to, to mention money, because of course, <laughs> Teachers College needs money there. And this is not a fundraiser, believe me. No. But um, I want to tie in this question of music uh, before we consider the music a little more specifically, with questions about how you communicate across generations. And I think this is really a fundamental issue in education, both in families and in institutions. And uh, you can say that different people from different generations, however you mark generations, have very different life experiences with regard to sexuality, with regard to the media, with regard to what you tune in on. Um, how, what are your thoughts? The music can bind if people listen to it together, but I'm wondering what are your thoughts about, you say you're straight-laced, what are your thoughts about how to talk with people of diff different generations? Grandchildren, <laughs> children? I think that the first thing to do is to take time. Everybody is so busy. Even older people, very often I hear uh, that somebody wants to have dinner with their grandmother, and the grandmother says, I'm too busy, I'm playing mahjong. <laughs> <laughs> so you are an example, Hope, that you, took, that you took time, never mind everything else that was happening during uh, the semester break, and you went to Colombia. Not easy. To, to see my granddaughter. Colombia. Right, that's what I wanted to say. But when you said the word media, I wanted to tell you one more thing. Do I have time? Yeah, okay, one, one more thing about that. First of all, I think that with music, it would be crucial, it would be wonderful if we could have a big, like a program where we can take different generations. But when you said media, I have to tell them one more thing. I never permitted my late husband, Fred, to come to any of my talks. <laughs> because now that we're going to ask for questions, he would sit where you are sitting, he would raise his hand. I wouldn't be able to just ignore him. <laughs> he would tell all of you, don't listen to her, it's all talk. <laughs> and, and I have to tell you one more thing, media. Fred Westheimer loved Diane Sawyer. When Diane Sawyer came to my apartment, Washington Heights, where I still live, I didn't have the heart to say to Fred, you can't be home. Because I knew that he really loved her. So, Fred and I are sitting on the couch where Hope and I are sitting here. Diane Sawyer is sitting where you are sitting. The cameras are rolling. And the first question Diane Sawyer says, and I have it on tape, Mr. Westheimer, how is your sex life? <laughs> <laughs> to which Fred said, the shoemaker's children don't have shoes. <laughs> So we are I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> we 
they're showing well, you let me music? let me just say one thing. I want to connect it with music. I did go, and, and we haven't mentioned that you have a daughter who is a TC alum and very distinguished and does Doctor. important work in her own way. But so this intergenerational issue is very big. But I did go to Bogota, Colombia to visit my granddaughter during the spring break, and I missed a concert. And I wanted to see it. And so you had the we idea. came up with the idea that this would be a perfect way to see segments like of just the last little segment from this concert where you were with Morty Ma Lazar. Morty Lazar. Maestro. Maestro Morty Lazar. And watch me conducting. conducting. And this is at <laughs> Avery Fisher Hall. So we invite you, and then after that, you can ask questions. But we invite you now, and I'm going to get to see it even though I went to Columbia, <laughs> to see Dr. Ruth conducting in Avery Fisher Hall. <laughs> so, oh. You have to move a little bit there so that you can see it. Yeah, that's true. I have to. I have to. Can I? No. Well, I can. I don't want to. I don't want to step on anyone. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You have to step to. Am I blocking? You? No, I'm blocking your view. You're good. You're good. Oh, move okay. over there. Okay. <laughs> yes. I, she forgot to tell you that I was in the Haganah. <laughs> I was in the underground, I was a sniper. I can still put five bullets into a red circle. I've never killed somebody, but I was very badly wounded from a cannon or a thing in Jerusalem. So I know how to give instructions. That's good there. And I know how to say, so what? So I did take them uh, and for, for an extra special treat. <laughs> Jewish uh, synagogue, and the way they were singing it, I've never heard it in my life, and it makes me cry, because I can feel my hand in my father's hand going to synagogue every Friday night. So I thank you all for being here. So that's in terms of your question about the music, how it links to growing up and to, the, and to the family. Because it made me kind of teary-eyed, because that was the melody from 
uh, from the synagogue uh, every Friday night, and I do feel my uh, hand in my father's hand uh, going to synagogue. Two things about that. One is, since he was an Orthodox Jew, he took a little, uh, some little money to buy me an ice cream on the way to synagogue, because after coming from synagogue, he wouldn't have uh, touched uh, any more money. But the, the, the importance here is just that these are the type of memories that go with me. I'm going to be 70. No, I'm going to be 87, not 78. <laughs> <laughs> we can always reverse things. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, the other thing I wanted to tell you, I had a hard time with my good friend, and Hope knows him, and you know Moti Lazar. Party was on the board of that concert, of, the, um, of that uh, um, Avery Fisher. 1,600 people were watching this, and 400 high school kids, 75 from Israel. The 75 from Israel, after this semester, going to the army. The, the ones, the 400 from uh, the United States, they're all good friends. I'm doing the same concert. Uh, in May, after the semester, in, in Israel with the Israelis. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. It wasn't easy for me to let the conductor, because I usually take control. <laughs> I, had, I had to let him have the control, because I couldn't have done that. So my hand was in his hand, but nobody saw that. You didn't see that, right? And I let him conduct. OK, the first person who is asking a question about a friend of yours, uh, <laughs> is going to get a keychain sex for dummies. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> Do we? 15 minutes for wait, questions. 15 minutes for questions. Yeah. Great. Uh, so wait, wait, wait one second. One, and you were two, and you are three. Okay. Okay. <laughs> then we get more. All right. <laughs> what kind of steps it would take to bring your kind of work into different cultures? I know that sexuality is a very difficult thing for people who are in other countries and it's not very appreciated. So. Wonderful question. I gave the talk that I usually give in Cairo to at a YPO, Young President's Organization Conference. Only married people were there, because that fitted into their uh, culture. And I can talk to different people, because I do my homework, and I find out about the culture. But the basic issue about erection, lubrication, about orgasms, I can talk when I fit it in to the culture. I can also say, that reminds me, it was the headline now in a big uh, article in Switzerland, that I said Freud was sexually ignorant. He did us women a tremendous disservice, because he should have taken a course with me. <laughs> he said that any woman who doesn't have an orgasm during intercourse is an immature woman. And we know much better today. So it has to fit into the culture. It had, you have to do your homework about different cultures. And in terms of teachers, you, if you teach a course on sex education, must have a seminar with the parents or an evening. Parents can't come during the day. And you have to say, this is what I want to do. Here is the shoebox that children will put in their questions, no names. And I want to talk about all those things so that they hear the correct answers and not the ones from the school bus. In today's world, you all have a tremendous responsibility. Girls menstruate at an earlier and earlier age. We don't know why. Some people say nutrition. So we cannot afford to have a nine-year-old go to school, go to the bathroom, find blood from a place that she never expected. She will never forget that. I will see her later in, in, in sex therapy. Not the only problem. Where boys and girls have to know about nocturnal emission. I had a young man whose mother was a good mother, but she was sexually illiterate because she screamed at him 
at the age of 13, what's the matter with you? How come you don't urinate in the bathroom? How come you urinate in bed? He didn't urinate in bed. He had nocturnal emissions. She never heard about that. So that you will have an obligation. If you are sex educators or any other education um, branch, to do that kind of sexuality education so that people get scientifically validated and good information. And also on the cultural point, you might want to mention your, your studies. Right. So I did a document, I do documentaries. I love doing those in Israel. I did one on the Ethiopian, one, the latest one on the Circassians. They're all way on Channel 13. Some of them you can get on YouTube, <laughs> on the Druze. And before I do that, I also do a book to, to accompany the documentary. I do my homework. For example, the Druze can have more than one woman. And he told me in the interview, no names, he said, if they're both, he lives with two, one house next to the other. He said, if they both love him, he's in big trouble if he's late because he has to be one night here, one night there. That's not just for sex, that's for companionship. So if, if they both love him, he's in big trouble if he's late. So I do my homework about all of these issues beforehand. For example, in the Quran it says, a man can have four women, if he can be fair to all four of them. Fair is not just sex. Fair is support them, companionship, all of those things. So I, I do my homework before that. Very important to be sensitive to the different cultural and religious. I did a lot of pre cana counseling. That's the Catholic couple who I engaged. And they sit around with a priest, Catholic priest, with an economist talking about issues of money, and with a sex therapist. So they only had couples who already were engaged that fitted into their framework. And so you have to be careful, you have to be sensitive, you have to know that not everything is New York City. <laughs> <laughs> there were some other questions? Yeah, there was a gentleman here and you are number three. <coughs> Dr. Ruth, in your career there was another very prominent sex therapist who was equally controversial, but not as well-loved as you. I was not a controversial. <laughs> you were ahead of your time, and so was he. And I wondered whether you ever collaborated or worked together, because if you did, it would have been like the meeting of the two sex titans of the century. <laughs> Dr. Albert Ellis, what do you think of his views as compared to yours? Albert Ellis, I thought you were talking about Saul Gordon who was at Syracuse, a wonderful sex educator, sure. but he was far away in Syracuse, I was here. I've met him, but I've never met Albert Ellis. I, I maybe when I started, maybe he was retired. I know who he is, but I've never met. Now, um, would have been very nice for my philosophy of life, that it needs to, to uh, be in a relationship, to have a man talking about issues of sex, but I want to tell you something. The issue, for example, about, uh, that I have to be put on the table. When I started, there were very few questions about homosexuality. From the start, I said, and I still say it today, we do not know the etiology, the reason for homosexuality. Any homosexual couple who came to my office, two men, two women, I treated them with the same respect that I would treat anybody else. But we don't know the etiology, not about heterosexuality and not about homosexuality. So the issue of respect is not debatable. But the issue of that we don't have all the answers, we have more, we need more studies. Cosmine, I have to tell you, it's such a thrill to meet you and see you. In the 70s, when I went to college, I happened to have gone to Clark University, we started the first birth control center, a peer counseling center, and we had the first national conference there of colleges across the country who were just starting the idea of peer counseling centers and disseminating sex education information. And we, there was a, an organization called ASAC at the time, 
American Association of Sex Educators. I was in It was the only place you could get a certification or legitimize in any way what you were doing, and it was extremely controversial to be a young woman at the time. There, and I have gone through my life saying there was no Dr. Ruth and there was no AIDS. And it was only limited at that time and sanctioned for the teenage mothers that they could get sex education in a legitimate way. It was very, very challenging. And all these years later, I saw my kids go to school, and it seemed to me that the sex education was highly incorporated into the health education curriculum. And I wonder if you could talk about what you've seen and are we satisfied today with where these health education curriculums are is, and how sex educators are being trained today. So that's a lot of questions. Okay, the, the, the one I will tell you, I am not satisfied because I think there has to be much, much more sexuality education. No question. But as I said before, we in this country have the best data, scientifically validated data, from Kinsey, Masters and Johnson, Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan, who trained me, which I worked with her for seven years, that has ever been available. But the data is already old. Kinsey is over 50 years old. We need new data. <coughs> so as far as the history of sex and the history of how demographics have a relationship to each other, whether that's conflicts like the Holocaust, whether that's conflicts like today in Israel and Palestine, or here with race relations, how can sexual education impact the way that different cultures and ethnic ethnographies can relate to each other? I would say, I would say if you are any interested in, in the issue of Palestine, Palestinians and Israel, I would say not to do that to sex education. Do that just to educating living together. Then the sex will be good. Right, 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 right. right, right. I guess, are we? Dr. Ruth, thank you so much. And by the way, my late husband was Albert Ellis. And I think the two of you would have flirted shamelessly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Albert Ellis. Uh, so, so my question is... Was he married? To me. The, I was the he third, was... The, yeah, I was the third wife. Okay, but I wouldn't have touched him. If he was married, I would not touch him. <laughs> but you don't know what he would have done. But that's what <laughs> especially in your later decades, your loving husband died. How do you maintain your obvious magnificent joie de vivre when bad things happen? Mm -hmm. I think I have to give you the answer that I said before of being grounded in having had 10 wonderful years in the early socialization. I was an only child. I had two grandmothers. I had one grandfather. They adored me. I had 13 dolls. I had doll houses. I still have doll houses now in Washington Heights. So I think that the joie de vivre is to say there are things that happen to everybody. Hope is a widow. Everybody has some things that are sad in their lives. You have to take time to mourn. You cannot go you know, right away on to the next uh, step, but then you have to say, let me see what I can do out of my life that will be the best. And uh, I, think, I think that's the, the message that I would like to give. <laughs> can I just, I'm afraid we're running out of time, but I think this is a perfect note and, and a wonderful question. A perfect note to say that we thank you for bringing us joie de vivre and music. And I think one of the answers to that question is you bring and you continue to bring wonderful joie de vivre to others, and they in turn love you for it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.